this joint meeting of the California Transportation and the California Air Resources Board uh, to order. We're going to get started. So welcome to San Diego. I'm delighted that Mary and I are um, here together and working together. And I think this was uh, proof in the pudding of, you know, when we uh, can come together and learn from each other. And so here we are today. So welcome to almost sunny San Diego. Uh, Commissioner <laughs> Kehoe uh, invited us down for the week, and here we go. But we're loving the rain. Sorry so about the weather. No, we're yeah. loving it. We're loving it. All you in the north are spoiled. You get all our water. So anyway, enough of me going off. We. <laughs> This is our second meeting of the day, so here we go. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, we're not going to do a roll call today, but delighted to be here. And I'm going to ask uh, Doug, our CTC safety officer, to give us a safety briefing this morning. Uh, first, so Doug, will you do that, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, the main exit is the way you came up. There's stairs to the left of the elevator. Make your way down the stairs. There's also an emergency exit this way. We'll take you to the other end of the building where there are also stairs. We do ask that you keep the aisles clear in case of an emergency so people can evacuate the room as quickly as possible. And also signage, those types of things, we are webcasting this, so be conscious of that fact that we don't want to block the webcasting uh, for the folks who can't be here in attendance so they can participate as well uh, by watching this online. Thank you. Okay, and then my other announcement is if you do wish to speak, um, we're going to ask you to fill out a speaker card, and we do have, have allowed for public comments at the end of our session today. So with that, um, we will get started and work, like I say, uh, delighted to be listening and learning. Uh, and I think this really speaks to the power of partnership, and I do want to give a shout out to Cal Cog and Bill Higgins and Tisha and the team uh, who probably are the little bit of the bridge in this to help the transportation industry uh, pay a little more attention in terms of uh, the miles per gallon. I think we had all just loved our improved mileage and uh, weren't really uh, focusing on, uh, I'll say, the structural issues involved with new rulemaking and everything. So with that, on behalf of my fellow CTC commissioners, thank you all for uh, staying. Uh, we're coming off two days of hearing. This is the second day. Uh, we also gave a sh shout out to Brian Annis, our Secretary of Transportation, uh, who joins us at every CTC hearing and wished him well in his new endeavors and invited him back on a regular basis. And we also told him that the whole commission would be at all of his hearings from now on because we are definitely multimodal in all of this. So seriously, Brian, we can't thank you enough. And uh, we have enjoyed. So, uh, you know, I think when it comes to the issue that we're talking about, the safe rule, you know, it's not just a transportation or an environmental issue. It's common sense and the world we're in and trying to really uh, be engaged and, and help uh, do what we're all charged to do, which is protect the environment and provide mobility for all. So here we are. We have some particular challenges in California, given the fact that we're big, we're diverse, we've got some topography issues, and we have the nation's gateways and trade corridors. So put all that together, and I think it makes uh, the job a little tougher for everybody trying to figure this all out. So um, just delighted that we're here, and I think we'll just, I'll be brief, and we'll move on. So I'd like to pass it to uh, Mary, my fellow co-chair, and uh, welcome, Mary. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Fran. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit longer to set the scene here, uh, and I hope you'll uh, indulge me in that, but I think it's helpful to have a bit of the uh, of the background. First of all, as you mentioned, uh, we're 
here because at our last joint meeting uh, as part of the regular process that we're now engaged in, um, we heard from local transportation agencies and CalCOG about the consequences, the potential consequences of a pending federal proposal to roll back our current vehicle standards. They raised the issue that the proposal, assuming it's to be finalized, could impact their ability to deliver on billions of dollars in local transportation projects as a result of an attack on California's ability to uh, carry out our uh, mandate under uh, federal law. So we've got this potential conflict here where a rule that's intended to roll back existing standards is going to interfere with the state's ability to comply with another rule. And that seems a little bit uh, difficult to explain, and I hope that during the panels today we'll have a, a better understanding of how that potentially works, because it is, frankly, somewhat uh, difficult to believe. But the proposal that we're talking about here is pending uh, within the administration. The final rule has to go through a process where the agency does whatever changes and updates it's going to do. They get the record done. They send the whole thing over to the White House Office of Management and Budget, and then um, uh, we don't know anything more and in terms of uh, what's actually going on. It's all supposedly you know, under the cone of silence until it sees the light of day. And we'll hear more about that as well. So we're in a situation here where there's a, we don't know exactly what the final rule is going to look like. But if it looks like you know, we hear rumors just like everybody does of what, what could happen, but what's most likely to happen is that something very close to the original proposal is what's going to actually come out at the other end of the process. And so that's really what uh, I want to talk about. Because um, if the proposal does go through as, as they plan, uh, what this would mean is that regulations that were adopted back in the Obama administration at the behest of the auto industry to try to bring together the CAFE law, uh, the fuel economy laws, air emissions laws, federal and state laws <clears throat> into one national program will be fundamentally broken. There will no longer be this one national program that the industry uh, worked so hard for. And that is not our intent. It's not something that we would like to see happen. This is not one of those situations where California is um, defying the federal government, you know, looking to set up a contrast between the way we view the world and the way the federal government views the world. In fact, it's uh, pretty much the opposite. We have been working from the very beginning of this to see if there was a way that we could come to an agreement, both with the administration and with the industry. But unfortunately, um, given the federal government's uh, control, and I, that may be putting it too strongly, but the fact that they have so many other levers that they can apply to the industry, uh, our ability to really do the kind of usual uh, regulatory negotiation that we would do with the companies has been significantly curtailed. And an attempt to try to bring together the federal agencies and the state really uh, was never successful. Um, I know that I've read some statements to the effect that uh, Air Resources Board wasn't willing to engage, but I assure you that uh, we did, in fact, put forward substantive thoughts about how we could come to a, a meeting of the minds with the federal government over their desire to roll back these standards, and we just never were able to get anything um, anything in response to that. So. The bottom line here is that the proposal is to um, take the existing fuel economy standards and the emission standards that go out to 2025 and freeze them at their current level, and simultaneously with that to uh, revoke California's ability to set its own standards, which we have had basically going back to 1970. So the waiver that we now are operating under today uh, to deal with greenhouse gas emissions would be um, overturned and simply uh, uh, taken away. Um, so that's what we're facing. And 
the effect of that, of course, isn't just a, you know, on uh, the Air Resources Board. It's on the state as a whole because of our air quality problems as a state. We have to do many things to try to achieve national ambient air standards, including submitting a state plan that shows how we will do that. And then we have to, in your world, the transportation world, um, have to have a, a plan that shows how all of our transportation programs and plans will conform with these federal standards. That is uh, not uh, going to be possible without the ability to set a standard for vehicles that uh, moves us in the right direction. So it really is a, it's quite a startling and difficult, uh, a difficult situation. Uh, I am happy to say that, you know, we have a number of cities as well as uh, other states that support us in this effort. Uh, we have 13 other states that follow California standards, so this won't just be uh, California being affected. Uh, we uh, have close to the close to the <coughs> half of the population in the United States actually uh, now represented by states that are uh, joining us in our commitment to cleaner cars and that have filed uh, lawsuits uh, on behalf of, of our position on this on this issue. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to the people who actually uh, do the work and will give us a lot more detail here. But I just think it's important that we as a state as much as possible pull together on this issue and that we all are able to present a united front when we're, uh, when we're talking about it. So uh, with that, I believe it's my job to turn it over to uh, Secretary Annis. Well, good morning, and thank you, Chair Nichols and uh, Chair Inman, for those remarks. And thank you to everyone. We have a big group here participating today. So it's, it is a very important transportation, public health, economic, and air quality issue. Uh, the potential impacts of this rule touch many aspects of transportation, both in California and across the country. The rule jeopardizes our ability to ensure emission reductions from the transportation sector meet state climate goals. A rollback of uh, fuel efficiency standards for vehicles would expose Californians in all geographies to worsening air quality and public health. I was in a, in a recent meeting with uh, the uh, uh, Secretary of uh, Cal EPA who was talking about goals to reduce asthma rates. And when you think about moving away from those instead of toward those goals, it's very, very depressing. Um, the rule has a potential, as was mentioned, to delay billions of dollars of transportation projects, including major transit improvements that could improve the mobility of Californians while also improving air quality. Uh, Californians' households uh, could see increased cost of transportation because they won't have access to the same range of fuel-efficient vehicles. So I, I do believe that uh, as Chair Nichols mentioned, there's, there's a growing sense of uh, unified thought here in California that these, this rule is harmful. And I think a, a unified uh, approach here to, to oppose the rule because of its many harms. I think we'll hear today what those harms are in more detail. And perhaps in some areas, the harms can be partially mitigated. In others, probably not. But uh, regardless, uh, I, I believe with this group and this important meeting today and workshop, uh, we'll all gain a stronger understanding of, of this issue, and I believe we'll become more unified as Californians to, uh, uh, you know, state the, uh, uh, state the position of the state that we do want to see improved transportation, we do want to see cleaner air, we do want to see improved health outcomes, and again, uh, thank you for the opportunity, for the invitation to be here today, and I look forward to the workshop. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. And um, next, we're going to ask Melinda uh, Grant from the uh, California Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. And I think, you know, from the CTC's perspective, we really realize how connected we all are in this. And I have to tell you that as a CTC commissioner, I just dread the term supercomputers. And I, 
uh, unfortunately have to report to you that we have a growing number of super commuters in our state and for those of you who aren't into our transportation lingo that definition is more than 90 minutes one way on a good day so uh, that is not sustainable and we're all trying to work and solve our housing crisis but Melinda really appreciate you being here today and joining us so thank you no thank you chairs and to the Commission and to everyone here it's we were very excited to get the invitation to be here because I think this is what we envision when you talk about transportation and the housing linkage. This is where it starts. It really starts at the ground of like learning about the technical pieces that a lot of folks are afraid to learn. And then once you learn them, we can kind of go back and figure out all the stuff in between. And at least personally myself, I was a somewhat super commuter. I commuted from the Bay Area to Sacramento for well over gosh, four years, and I was glad to do it, and I could tell you every route and every time and every, you know, uh, <laughs> transit time, and, but it was hard, and I tell folks, you can do it, and you can do it well, but it was hard, and I'm still living a dual life and have a, a home in two different places, but this is what we do, you know, when we're called to serve, and so we want to make it a little bit easier for everyone else. Um, but yes, I'm here from the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. I'm the undersecretary there, and, and the secretary is, I mean, excuse me, the agency is actually quite large, where half of our agency is business regulation, and then the other half is housing. And so under housing, we have the Department of Housing and Community Development, we have the California Housing Finance Agency, we have the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, we have the Department of Real Estate, and we have the Homeless Financing and Coordinating Council. And so we touch not only housing, but a lot of different aspects of housing. Um, so many of you may ask why I'm here today, but thank you for the wonderful introduction of, of linking us. But um, just a few quick remarks. Increasingly clear that there are inherent linkages between housing and transportation. And the more coordinated we are with policy planning and programming, the better outcomes we will have for our communities. There exists inherent linkages between housing and transportation. We know that increasing housing supply in high demand areas near job centers, good schools, and other amenities will provide alternatives to long commutes and thereby reduce wear and tear on roadways and reduce the need for expensive highway expansions. When people can afford to live near their jobs, they are more likely to take public transportation or alternative forms of transportation. Thank you, Secretary. <laughs> um, the governor's 2019 budget further strengthens this linkage, asking our agencies to take one step further and make clear programmatic linkages between our housing allocations and some transportation programs. With regard to the potential impacts of federal vehicle standards rollback, two impacts stand out to me. The first order of impact, of course, is climate change where climate change is having a severe impact on California cities and communities, as we all know. Since 2017, we have seen thousands of homes and whole communities lost to wildfires each year. We are in a situation now where we are losing 10,000 homes per year to wildfires, yet building less than 80,000 new homes when we know we need 180,000 annually to meet our growing needs. It is imperative that we tackle climate change head on, and if we lose certain policy levers, such as fuel efficiency standards, to plan for alternative ways to safeguard housing and stock in communities from the impact of future natural disasters. Second order impact, the cost of transportation is going to increase for families. For those that cannot benefit from a more fuel efficient car, their percentage of income dedicated to gas will increase proportionally and cried out other expenditures. And I know, thank you, Secretary Annis, for, for touching on this. This is particularly difficult now given the affordability issues we have in the state, especially around housing. We may see a shift in behaviors where people and families strive to live closer to their work and places of employment. Um, but this is generally desirable, as we know that quality of life improves when people can afford to live near their jobs. And we know that fewer miles traveled can have a positive impact on our environment. However, we also know that we are in a unique time where there is a mismatch between where the homes are built, being built and where the jobs are, especially in the affordable range. The federal vehicle standards rollback may exacerbate this problem where the demand to live near, near jobs far exceeds our existing housing infrastructure. 
We do have a number of existing state housing programs that may help address this, focusing on building in areas of economic and social opportunity, near existing and future transportation hubs, on infill sites, and using techniques that are very synergistic with the state's climate goals. As I mentioned before, in the governor's 2019 budget, there is a purposeful focus on production of units and a new $750 million is in proposed dollars to support local jurisdictions with $250 million dedicated to planning for production and $500 million going into the infill infrastructure grant program for jurisdictions that are meeting their production targets. With that, thank you for listening and I'm excited to be here at the workshop today and look forward to the presentations ahead. Thank you. Melinda, one thing that I would add is being a developer by trade uh, yes. in my other day job, um, we often have permits that we need from the federal uh, authorities right. and uh, other federal touch points. So I do think there are potential impacts as we talk about those later in terms of delaying our ability to deliver Mm -hmm. any kind of uh, development whenever uh, we have the uncertainty around our uh, plan and the That's process right. that we're all required to go through. So I think that is another challenge to add to our list there. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to be educated. So Jennifer, good to see you again. Jennifer and I go way back to uh, our Lowenthal days together, I think. <laughs> yeah, good morning. It is a pleasure to be here. My name is Jennifer Gress, and I'm the Chief of the Sustainable mm -hmm. Transportation and Communities Division with the California Air Resources Board. And um, I, it is such a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. As Chair Inman has said, I got the opportunity to work with many of you back in the day, eight years ago now, when I was with the Senate Transportation and Housing Committee, and of course, uh, my former colleague, uh, Brian Annis, too. So I am here uh, to provide an overview of President Trump's proposed rollback of the federal passenger vehicle standards and revocation of California's right to implement our own vehicle standards and the potential effects this action could have in California. So let's start with a little bit background. California has a long history of adopting the necessary regulations to meet federally mandated health-based air quality standards. Under the Federal Clean Air Act, to be enforceable, California's regulations must be granted a waiver from federal preemption by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. The Clean Air Act includes this waiver provision allowing California to set its own standards because we have the most challenging air pollution problems in the nation owing to the high concentration of people and vehicles and its unique terrain. Any state that is not attaining the federal standard or is planning, working on attaining it, or maintaining its current standards may opt to follow California's regulations. And states covering over one-third of the market have, uh, have opted to do so. Over the last 50 years, due to local and state regulatory requirements, incentives, and initiatives, emissions have been trending down across the state, and agencies around the world copy California's programs. We've seen a lot of progress. We have met our 2020 greenhouse gas emissions target in 2016, four years ahead of schedule, all while our economy has grown. Diesel particulate matter emissions, which have serious local community health implications, have decreased approximately 80% since 1990. New vehicles emit just 1% of the emissions they did in 1970, and statewide emissions and associated health impacts from air toxics exposure have been reduced by about 75%. Despite this progress, further reductions from the transportation sector are needed. And in 2012, CARB adopted a set of regulations collectively called the Advanced Clean Cars Program, which combined the control of smog causing, you know, what we call criteria pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions into a single coordinated package, along with a technology forcing mandate for zero emission vehicles. This package of regulations estimated that cars would emit 75% less smog-forming pollution than the average car sold in 2012, 
It would reduce greenhouse gas emissions from new vehicles by approximately 40% and result in at least 8% of new cars sold to be a zero emission vehicle or plug-in hybrid. In October 2012, US EPA finalized national GHG standards for passenger vehicles that are substantially similar to the California GHG regulations for the 2017 through 2025 model years. CARB then adopted a provision that allowed manufacturers to comply with the federal standards as long as those standards remained as stringent as California's Advanced Clean Cars program. This suite of regulations created a harmonized national program. As part of the commitment to one national program, CARB, US EPA, and NHTSA conducted a joint technical assessment and midterm evaluation that concluded the adopted standards were technically feasible and appropriate, and that compliance costs were lower than previously estimated. California's midterm review found many manufacturers were over complying with the GHG requirements and were offering over 70 different vehicle variants that were already in compliance with the GHG standards for later model years without using any hybrid or ZEV technology, so using traditional combustion technology. In spite of the fact that the technologies needed to comply with future standards are available today, and that expected costs are lower than originally anticipated. Last year, the Trump administration withdrew these conclusions and has proposed to roll back the standards. The administration has labeled this regulation the safer, affordable, fuel efficient, or safe rule. But as you will hear today from me and others, the rule is neither safe nor affordable. The only beneficiary as revealed by a New York Times investigation is the oil industry. Specifically, the Trump administration has proposed that new vehicle standards flatline after model years 2020, <coughs> rather than become more stringent through 2025. The administration has further proposed to revoke California's authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions and enforce our zero emission vehicle mandate, both now and in the future. <coughs> this proposal is not supported by sound science, technological need, or what is best for US consumers. Over half a million commenters have publicly voiced their opinions on the proposal, largely in opposition. So what are the impacts of this proposed rule? To set the stage, it's important to note that 93% of Californians are currently living in communities that have, had, have unhealthy air. They're not meeting federal air quality standards, despite the actions that CARB, the local air districts, and industry have collectively undertaken over the years. The federal rollback only exacerbates this problem and would have serious environmental and public health consequences for Californians, threatening future attainment and increasing community exposure to pollution. As a result of higher vehicle emissions and increased fuel production from oil refineries, the federal rollback will increase nitrogen oxide emissions, the primary precursor to ozone, by 2.2 tons per day statewide. More than half of these emissions will occur in the South Coast region, where every reduction is necessary to meet the standard. As shown in the chart on the right, even without the rollback, the South Coast is already anticipated to have difficulty reaching the standards. In the South Coast, where over 80% of NOx emissions come from mobile sources, revoking California's ability to regulate ZEVs will have longer term and more pervasive impacts by delaying the deployment of ZEVs in the transfer of zero emission technology to heavy duty vehicles and equipment used in freight, movement, construction, and agriculture. Certain communities are especially vulnerable to increases in criteria pollutant emissions and will be particularly impacted by the federal rollback. This map shows those communities that are disproportionately burdened by pollution as identified by Cal Enviro screen. Those most burdened are shown in red and orange and contain a significant portion of California's population. These same communities are overly burdened by high levels of ozone, diesel particulate matter, and air toxics due in large part to their proximity to highway corridors and other goods movement activity. Climate change. The proposed rollback severely hampers the state's ability to meet its greenhouse gas reduction targets. The recent 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report highlighted that the effects of climate change are upon us. 
As Californians, we have seen these consequences in the form of more severe droughts from decreased rainfall and snowpack, coupled with the most destructive wildfire season on record. Additionally, warmer temperatures will influence key air pollutants and result in more severe adverse health effects. Transportation infrastructure will be affected by sea level rise that threatens ports and low-lying airports, more intense storms that cause flooding and washout of roadways, landslides following wildfires, and heat waves that can increase road buckling or rail warping. The state has already met the AB32 goal of returning to 1990 levels, but as this graph shows, meeting the SB32 and carbon neutrality targets will require deep emission cuts from all sectors of the economy. As with criteria pollutants, every ton of reduction will be needed and the federal rollback slows down our progress precisely at the time that we need to be accelerating our efforts. Electrification of both light and heavy duty vehicles is the only pathway to climate stabilization. Removing California's authority to require manufacturers to develop zero, zero emission vehicles severely hinders California's ability to address climate change. All right. The yellow line on this chart shows what emissions would be without our GHG regulations. This is focused on uh, light duty vehicles in the transportation sector. This lower teal line shows how much we estimated GHG emissions would have been with our current GHG standards in place without any rollback. The dotted blue line shows the increase in GHG emissions resulting from the federal rollback. As you can see, Californians would lose half of the GHG tailpipe emission reductions that are expected from the clean car standards. Combined with increased refinery activity, by 2030, GHG emissions would increase by 15 million metric tons, which is the equivalent of adding an extra 3 million cars on the road, and represents almost 10% of the reductions needed to meet the state's SB32 goals. It's not just California that will feel these effects. Consumers nationwide will be affected, burdened by increased spending on gas. This rollback is an arbitrary and capricious attack on all states' authority that limits our national ability to protect public health, especially for our most vulnerable communities. Finally, California's vehicle regulations have proven in the past to spur manufacturer innovation. Limiting our regulatory authority may ultimately hurt consumers by reducing their choices for advanced technology cutting edge vehicles. The proposed rollback would also jeopardize our state implementation plans, or SIPs, for meeting federal ambient air quality standards for ozone and particulate matter. SIPs rely on our current passenger vehicle regulations to attain the bulk of emission reductions. Without the ability to force its vehicle regulations and continue to move technology forward, California may not be able to achieve the ozone standard by the deadline in 2031 in the South Coast in San Joaquin Valley without taking dramatic countermeasures to meet emission reduction requires. As Ms. Taylor will discuss in greater detail, jeopardizing our SIPs puts at risk conformity determinations that are necessary to move forward with transportation projects. In closing, the proposed federal rollbacks would undermine California's ability to meet federally mandated air quality standards and threaten transportation funding. Though CARB has made a good faith attempt to negotiate with the federal government to present, prevent this proposal from going forward, there is no clear signal on what a final proposal might include or when it would be released. While we continue trying to influence the final rulemaking and prepare to litigate if necessary, it is clear that undoing California's regulations has deep and wide implications on SIPs and attainment of the standards. If anything is clear, though, it is the need for our agencies to integrate our policies and programs in order to better achieve air quality, health, mobility, climate, and economic goals together. This rulemaking presents a good opportunity for us to work together towards these common objectives, and we are grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you very much for having us and for participating in this process with, with us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric White.
Jennifer, before you leave, can I ask one question? Can you roll back to the slide? You had the yellow, blue dots, and the mm -hmm. um, blue-green. Um, explain to us that aren't experts in the modeling the difference. The baseline is without our greenhouse gas standards, and the dotted blue is where we would be with this safe rule? Yeah, so yellow, yellow is baseline. We have no advanced clean cars program. The bottom teal is with advanced clean cars. Okay. And the blue line, the dotted line, is the proposed rollback. So and what so, would the delta be between the dotted and the yellow? I would have thought those would have been. I think it's 20%. I think, it's, I think it cuts the benefit in half. It does, okay. Because I, I, I was reading that as no uh, standard, or is that just uh, the 2020 versus previous improvements, right? Maybe? I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. And then um, for our speakers going forward, we are all guilty of acronym soup. So <laughs> for the fact that we're all listening and learning together, let's try to. Uh, be a little longer and talk about state improvement plan or something just to help everybody because if you're not in the other guy's world the acronyms can be a little confusing uh, point point well taken I just want to add while uh, while Eric is uh, making his way up there that um, one thing that uh, was not covered and I want to make sure people understand is that because of state law AB 32 if we lose the the state vehicle standards we have to fill up the gap with other measures that the state takes. So just to, to be clear, we would have to find either something in this world of industry that we could squeeze more than we already have, or uh, we'd have to go to the transportation sector and find the emissions through some other means other than the vehicles themselves, which basically puts you into the realm of transportation planning, which we all know is slow to see effects and potentially very disruptive. So just I have to add that additional <laughs> additional point. Thank you. We have another question? I, I was just going to say, I think how we term baseline is important, just putting that slide up. Um, I, I would consider the baseline what we have on the blue line. I know you've called ba baseline of, of yellow, but that's prior to the Clean Cars program. So the law currently in effect today is the blue line. So I think that's an important characterization. So the, their pro, the, the federal program would be an increase above what we currently have in place today. And that's, I sort of consider that the baseline. And the other thing is, I think the fact that when the Clean Air Act was enacted, there was recognition that California was particularly challenged because of our topography, because of our number of people packed mm -hmm. into the region and the fact that we're the nation's gateways and trade corridors and we move the nation's freight through our region, a uh, significantly portion of the nation's freight anyway. So I think that way back when, in 78, mm -hmm. Mary, is that? Uh, when well, it was, really, it was 1970. 70, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, I kind of tie it to my children's birth and remember from there. So uh, we'll go with that. But uh, anyway, in the 70s. So I think early, early, early on, folks recognized that we had unique challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important part. Right. So, okay, Eric, thank you. Great. Well, well good morning, uh, uh, Chair Inman and Chair Nichols and members of the commission and the board. It's a pleasure to be here today on behalf of the California Air Pollution Control Officers Association, or CAPCOA. My name is Eric White, and I'm the Air Pollution Control Officer for Placer County, but I'm also the President of CAPCOA. So we certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here to express our significant concerns around the safe, or some might call it the unsafe, proposal that the federal government uh, has made and the impacts that they may have at the local level on the work that we are doing to address community impacts, meet federal and state ambient air quality standards, and address the impacts associated with climate change. So CAPCOA is a statewide organization of the 35 local air districts here in California. We have a very long and successful uh, track record of working collaboratively with CARB and with the state to address air quality issues. Uh, because of how the air quality regulatory structure is, was created here in California, 
CARB is responsible for addressing most of the issues around mobile sources, and local air districts are tasked with addressing emission impacts associated with stationary sources in their jurisdictions. So we have a very long history as well of working with our communities and in our communities to address those that have been significantly burdened by air emissions from sources, and in particular, stationary sources. The districts are also responsible for developing the components that will go into the state implementation plan, or SIP, relative to the sources that they regulate. So these would be things like refineries and power plants, gas stations, those that are associated with transportation activities. And so any impacts on what those sources may produce, how much they may produce, um, is going to have impacts on the work that we do to continue to reduce emissions at the local level. Uh, as I mentioned, the districts have had a long history of working with local communities, but several years ago, the legislature, the state promulgated new requirements under AB 617, the Community Air Protection Program, to continue to further and accelerate the reductions in disproportionately impacted communities here in California. One of the things we have long known is that many communities, in fact, most communities, are impacted mostly by mobile sources cars, trucks, trains that operate in these communities and in these neighborhoods. Most of the air toxic exposure that the population here in California is exposed to comes from mobile sources, whether it's diesel particulate matter from heavy trucks or it's benzene emissions that the public is exposed to when they put gasoline in their vehicle. Zero emission vehicles have the ability and provide the opportunity to reduce all of those emissions down to levels which is where we need to get if we're going to be serious about addressing risk impacts and criteria pollutant impacts here in California. And in fact, we know in our meetings with communities through the Community Air Protection Program that these are exactly the type of technologies and the type of strategies that communities want to see um, deployed in their neighborhoods. Many programs that CARB runs, whether it's Clean Cars for All or others, equity programs are designed to bring these bring these technologies down to the local level into these communities. Anything that would disrupt the flow and the advancement of these technologies is going to go counter what we know these people, the, the, these residents and the people who live in these communities really want and are looking for. Any reductions that we would see in fuel economy standards for light duty vehicles necessarily will result in a loss of reductions of fossil fuel consumption here in California. Much of the fossil fuels that are consumed in California, gasoline and diesel, are produced here within the state. So a, a emission reductions that local air districts were expecting they're going to see as fuel reduction levels need to go down due to do, reduced fuel consumption here in the state are not going to be realized. What that is going to mean is emissions from refineries are, are not going to decline as quickly as they could under the Advanced Clean Cars program, under the existing federal light duty vehicle program. Many of these refineries are located in communities that are already heavily burdened. In fact, this is a picture of the uh, uh, refinery that is in Rodeo, California, up in Northern California. This picture looks very similar to ones you would see in Wilmington or Carson or Richmond. These communities have been burdened for a very long time with emissions from the facilities that are there, including the refinery facilities that are there. So this is going to have a negative impact on those communities, as well as emissions from the existing fueling infrastructure. I mentioned the public exposure to benzene. More higher fuel consumption will lead to more frequent refueling, which will lead to greater exposure to benzene. So there is a very real toxic component that is associated with this that, that regular everyday citizens will experience as without these regulations being fully implemented and as we delay the state's transition from combustion modes of transportation to zero emission modes of transportation. Uh, Jen mentioned uh, quite eloquently the impacts that we are going to see on the SIP. I mentioned that in, in, many, in many air districts, 80% or more of the emissions come from mobile sources. So anything that is gonna delay or reduce the emission reductions that are going to be realized from light duty vehicles is gonna have profound impacts on how local, uh, local air districts uh, meet their requirements and attain the ambient air quality standards. Um, what this will likely mean as, as and, and I believe Chairman, Chairman Nichols mentioned the need to be whole on a, in a program, 
any loss of benefits in one area are going to need to be made up in another area. And this will necessarily mean local districts are going to go, have to go back to their stationary sources and look for additional emission reductions. We have been very successful over the last 50 years reducing emissions from stationary sources down to some of the lowest levels in the nation and, in fact, the world. So having to go back to those sources is both going to be challenging from a technological standpoint as well as significantly more expensive. The most cost-effective emission reductions that can be achieved come from the mobile source sector. They are both the least, least, least costly and the most cost-effective relative to other strategies that can, be, that can be implemented. Jennifer also mentioned issues around conformity. Um, this is going to have a significant impact on how local jurisdictions move forward with transportation projects in their jurisdictions. Um, not meeting SIP obligations can lead to conformity, I'm sorry, sanction issues around federal transportation funding that would come to the state as well. Um, and as, um, as Under Secretary Grant mentioned, you know, I'm very pleased to see today that you have brought together transportation and housing and air quality because they all are interrelated. Those of us that work at the local level work very closely with developers and local jurisdictions on understanding, evaluating, and mitigating the impacts associated with development projects, whether they're transportation projects, whether they're commercial projects, whether they're housing projects. And we know there's a housing shortage here in California. So anything that is going to further hinder our ability to bring new units into the marketplace, affordable units into the marketplace, um, is only going to exasperate an already very challenging situation that we have around housing. Um, Jennifer mentioned a little bit about some of the issues in the South Coast, and let me, maybe I can put just a little finer point on some of those, some of those. So the South Coast 2016 SIP relies on the benefits that the existing zero emission vehicle or ZEV program provides. And in fact, those benefits alone are insufficient for the district to meet both the 20, it's 2023 and 2031 uh, ambient ozone air quality uh, attainment dates. Any delays or any rollback um, or the removal of those obligations is only going to make that it more difficult for the South Coast Air District. And I believe they're here today and they can certainly talk um, in more detail about that. If the region cannot meet its standards under the Federal Clean Air Act, it is, it is potentially subject to a federal implementation plan which is the federal government strategy to bring the region into attainment. This would be a very undesirable outcome for the state, for the region, uh, to try to attain those standards. Um, the greenhouse gas impacts as well are very significant. So while local air districts uh, don't have a prominent role in addressing greenhouse gas emissions, the impacts of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions have a profound impact on the work that we do. Higher ambient, air higher ambient temperatures we know will lead to higher ambient ozone levels as well, peak ozone levels. So in a warming climate, the work that we are doing to reduce ozone levels and meet those standards is going to be all the more difficult if we don't continue to make progress in reducing greenhouse gases. We also know in a changing, in climate, in changing climate that we see more frequent and severe drought. More frequent, we see significant tree mortality in the forested areas of the state. Um, and we know that we will see both more frequent and most, more severe wildfires. And I think we all remember the issues around wildfire and, PM, and particulate matter impacts last summer and last fall, whether you were in Southern California or Northern California. Wildfires are real. They are becoming more significant and having greater health impacts on our population and delaying progress on reducing greenhouse gases is only going to make those issues worse moving forward. We also have to think about the potential impacts on SB 375 and regional greenhouse gas targets as well and what delaying those reductions is going to mean to, to those regions as they, as they work to uh, address, those, address greenhouse gases. And Jen talked a little bit about um, the issues around states' rights, and I know you'll have uh, our affiliate at the national level talk a little bit about this later uh, through the NASA National Association of Clean Air Agencies. But local air districts are dependent on actions by both CARB and the federal government to deliver significant and meaningful emission reductions from mobile sources. 
the waiver is a critical component of how that mechanism has worked and has worked effectively up until this point. CARB and US EPA have had a strong and good working relationship that recognizes the unique needs of California um, to deliver the emission reductions and the, and the technologies that we need to continue to make improvements on air quality. This proposal goes counter to those decades of cooperative working together um, and seems to go counter to um, the work and the, the efforts of the, the, the words of the federal administration to work cooperatively with states. Cooperative federalism seems to have failed in this particular instance. Um, and the, the ZEV waiver, if the, removing the ZEV waiver will result in California and the U.S. falling behind other parts of the world in developing these technologies and bringing these technologies to market. These are exactly what we need now. We need them today. We need to accelerate the pace of their availability and their deployment. And removing the ZEV mandate will do exactly the opposite of what we need. It's going to lead to issues with the state and local, local jurisdictions meeting federal ambient air quality standards and providing the technologies and the emission reductions that our communities are looking for us all to provide them um, as uh, moving forward. So with that, it's been an honor and a pleasure to, to talk with you today. Um, and uh, with that, I will conclude. Thank you, Eric. Okay, now we're going to move on to an overview of the regional transportation plan. So Tanisha, I think you're up next. Thank you, uh, Chair Nichols, Chair Inman, for having me here today. It really is an honor to talk about this and to try to bridge um, some of the gap of the discussion we just heard about the air quality and transportation impacts and bring it um, a little closer to home. Um, one of the things I want to start with, um, and I will openly admit this, my, I am known for sucking the life out of the room, and I will suck the life out of the room today um, with my presentation. Uh, my father, when I was seven months pregnant, died from exposure to bad air quality. And I want to remind everybody that today we are talking about the impacts to the residents of California when we talk about all of the impacts today. When we hear from CARB, when we hear from myself, when we hear from the MPOs, at the end of the day, these are impacts that the residents of California will feel. And so I start with a quote from an Air Resources Board meeting to remind us of what the residents of California are already telling us. And so we hear um, that a resident of California simply wants to clean up the air as soon as possible so that my son can go out to play. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about how we clean up air so that our kids and our families can go outside to play and live the lives that they seek to live throughout the state of California. And so I'm going to admit, I'm going to stay very high level in my presentation about how transportation and air quality touch in this world and why it's so important for all of us to work together. So the first thing I'm going to say, I'm going to begin and I'm going to end, but there's nothing safe about the safe rule. I think we have to keep saying that, we have to keep reminding ourselves of that as we go through this process, because the title was picked intentionally. It is picked to invoke that there's something safe out there about this, and there is nothing safe out there about the safe vehicle rule. As you heard from Jen, the rule affects 93% of the state's population if it is finalized. Um, traditionally, when we talk about air quality impacts, we think of the large urban areas of the state. In this case, 14 of the 18 states MPO regions will be impacted, as well as eight rural counties. And I want to emphasize the rural counties because we don't always talk about the rural counties when we talk about air quality. Uh, just a reiteration that the safe rule, the proposed safe rule, freezes federal GHG and CAFE standards after 2020. And it seeks to revoke CARB's authority to implement the zero emission vehicle and greenhouse gas mandates. So how does this impact transportation? Um, we've heard the term SIP, State Implementation Plan, which as Mary called it an air quality plan for simple terms during the discussion today. Um, the Regional Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategies that the MPO regions are responsible for is one piece of the puzzle that helps us get to attainment of the standards. It is the mobile source, one piece of the mobile source component of the State Implementation Plan. Um, that's important because when we talk about how transportation fits into the puzzle, it is a piece of the larger puzzle for how we actually achieve the standards for which the federal government expects us to achieve. 
So I'm going to talk one slide, a little bit technical, and then I'm coming out of the technical side of things. And so when we talk about transportation, and Chair Nichols has already alluded to this as well as the ARB and CAPCOA slides, is that transportation as a component of the state implementation plan, the air quality plan, is required to show that we conform to the plan itself. We conform to the Clean Air Act. And so they give us these things they call emissions budgets that basically say, here's how much you can do transportation. You can't exceed that. Um, it is, and I have a monopoly piece, um, it's one of those where you can't pass go if you can't demonstrate transportation conformity. You cannot adopt your regional transportation plan. Um, so that's, that's the link between transportation and air quality. Um, moving into the, the bigger picture, which is all what we're all here to talk about, um, it threatens our ability to meet our goals. Um, this is not just a transportation or air quality issue, and as I highlighted at the beginning of my presentation, these are impacts that are felt by the residents of California, and I want to keep reiterating that because it is a very technical issue. Um, and we lose that this is about the people, and this is about the impacts that people like myself mm -hmm. will feel as a result of bad air quality. Um, so the first goal, clearly it impacts our ability to meet our clean air goals. It also impacts potentially our ability to meet our GHG reduction goals. Public health, equity, we've already heard a lot of discussion about the disadvantaged communities. Uh, they will potentially be breathing dirty air longer. So there are equity impacts potentially of the rule. Economic vitality, uh, the transportation system supports our economy and so there will be economic impacts if the rule is felt. And who knew rolling back the CAFE standards would have this large of an impact on the state of California and other states throughout the nation, but it will. And I think that's important that we start to talk about and continue to talk about these impacts um, that the state of California will feel as we move forward. Uh, we heard yeah. it a little bit yesterday when Hassan Ikrata from the San Diego Association of Governments spoke. There will be goods movement impacts from an inability potentially of transportation products to be delivered. We have three of the ten largest ports in the nation. So this will have a national impact as well. And I want to remind, this is not a state of California issue. This is an issue that impacts the nation as a whole. We've heard from uh, secretaries and undersecretaries that it will have a housing impact, and I won't belabor that point. Um, how we connect transportation and housing is clearly a goal within the state of California. Um, conservation of land and natural resources. Uh, we, the goal of our regional transportation plans and sustainable community strategies is to grow smartly and in the right places supported by transportation. Transportation is a key indicator and a key piece of that puzzle of how we grow, and so we potentially will have uh, issues or challenges with how we conserve land and where we grow. Um, less time on the road. If we cannot deliver our transportation system as envisioned, it's anticipated that congestion will increase. Uh, nobody likes to sit in congestion, especially our super commuters. Uh, so this may potentially add more time because we can't deal with some of those goals and all of those things that we've talked about already. And safety. Safety is a huge goal. Um, it's not last because it's the least important, but it's last because that's just the order it came up in. Um, but safety is potentially impacted. And again, there's nothing safe about the safe vehicle rule. So what are the consequences? Those are very high level. We may have the impacts to those things. We likely will if the rule is finalized. So what are the consequences? So in addition to threatening our ability to meet our goals, there are some pretty specific consequences should the proposed rule be finalized. There are billions of dollars of transportation projects at risk. Um, I think you heard from James Corliss, the Sacramento Area Council of Governments Executive Director yesterday, that we are uh, approximately 2,000 transportation projects at approximately 130 billion, with a B, may be impacted by the proposed safe vehicle rule. Uh, those impacts could range from project delays <laughs> to projects not being built. It really depends on what the final rule says, um, but clearly that will have a large impact. It will have an impact on the types of jobs that come to the community and the state of California. It will have an impact on people's health. It will have an impact on how people travel to and from work. 
Um, this includes five rural projects totaling $50 million in the state of California. Just as a reminder, this is not just an urban issue. It is an urban and rural, and it affects 93% of the state of California's populations, potentially. This includes transit projects. Um, generally, people think of highway projects, and they say, oh, well, you know, Maybe there's a silver lining. Maybe there's something that's good about the rule. There's nothing good about the rule. And you're going to hear me say that like a million times while I'm up here. Um, but this includes transit projects. And so when we think of light rail, when we think of large BRT projects, those types of projects are not exempt from the air quality process. And so as we move forward, um, in hearing a lot of people as they're first <laughs> briefed about the safe vehicle rule, because it is such a technical rule, I've heard a lot of people say, perhaps there's a silver lining. Mm -hmm. There is no silver lining. There is nothing good about the safe rule. And I want to reiterate that because if we go into this fight thinking, well, maybe there's some good that comes out of this or maybe there's something that comes out of that, there is nothing good that comes out of the safe vehicle rule, nothing. Um, so to reiterate the point about transit, I've taken a couple of existing projects to give you some examples of what types of projects. So these are projects that are already built. So if these projects were new after the finalization of the safe vehicle rule, they would not be able to move forward. They would not be able to be added to a regional transportation plan because they are subject to the requirements of transportation conformity. So the Sacramento Blue Line extension to Consumnes River College and San Diego's South Bay Rapid Transit Line. Just to give you an example of the types of transit products, so BRTs, bus rapid transits, as well as light rail transportation. Uh, in terms, oh, I'm sorry, I had a question. Um, in terms of additional consequences, and I'm just about to wrap up, uh, we've heard this already, I just want to reiterate it, increased carbon dioxide and climate change emissions, increased, uh, Criteria pollutant emissions, I think we've heard that in South Coast, the, that uh, nitrous oxide emissions, which is a precursor to ozone, may increase by 400 uh, to 430 tons in South Coast by 2030. And then just some next steps. Um, the MPR regions, as well as the rural regions, are reaching out to the federal congressional delegation. Um, Southern California is there now. SACOG has been back within the last uh, week, as well as uh, the San Joaquin Council of Governments. Uh, continued statewide collaboration like today. Uh, we clearly have to figure this out because, again, there's nothing good about the safe rule. And then continued outreach to Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the National Highway Transit Transportation Safety Administration, uh, who is in coordination with US EPA proposing the actual safe rule itself. So in closing, I just want to remind everything, everyone, there's nothing safe about the safe rule. So I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Anybody have a question? Yes, Commissioner Kehoe. Uh, thank you, Tisha, for um, a very good presentation. Thank you. Can you give us any more detail or uh, on how your discussions are going with the congressional delegation or the federal regulators? Um, so I can. So in terms of the federal regulators and the, the discussions that we've had, um, Federal Highway Administration, US EPA, and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, NHTSA, um, they are not talking to us. So because there is an active rulemaking, um, they cannot answer our questions. They are at least listening, um, and they are aware of the issues. I think that's why we have, I think I saw Vince somewhere. Vince, are you Vince listening? I can see you back there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we've been getting some, some questions. Uh, in terms of going back to D.C., one of the messages that we've gotten from some of our congressional delegations is that they're happy to hear the messages that we're sending. Um, it's not necessarily resonating because, one, um, there's a challenge with how, how this impacts nationally. So it's, it's red versus blue, potentially. Um, there's also challenges with uh, the technical nature of the issue and getting the understanding there, but they are listening. I can't say that we're, we're, we're trying to move the process and Secret or Feinstein's office has agreed to work with us to uh, send letters to Secretary Chow, who is the Secretary of the Department of Transportation as well. 
Tanisha, can I ask you, just for benefit of those folks that might not hang out with us every day, <laughs> um, can you do a quick thumbnail sketch of the regional transportation planning that we're all required by law to do yes. in the transportation world and how that rolls up with our local air district into the SIP. I think it would be good because we have a number of our regions right now that are in that process. It seems, you know, I see Darren back there and it seems like they're always reaching out to the business community calling us down yeah. for another meeting uh, to talk about how we're going to do our regional uh, transportation planning and perhaps they'll cover that later. But I think it's a good little overview. If you can just a quick summary. Absolutely. I can do that in less than five minutes. So um, we currently have four agencies in active regional transportation plan development. And, and that starts from kind of a bottoms up grassroots approach of what are the transportation improvements? What are the strategies and goals that we value as a region? So the, the goals that I've run through in this presentation are the goals that the regional transportation plan also tries to achieve. Um, in terms of how that process technically works is so we do the outreach, we ask what's valuable to the community, we take that input, we build a project list um, based on that input, and we build a land use scenario that becomes the Sustainable Community Strategy and Regional Transportation Plan. Um, once we have that project list in the land use portion of the Regional Transportation Plan, uh, we run it through what we call our travel demand model. And a travel demand model effectively simulates how people travel within each of the regions. Um, the output of that travel demand model is what we call vehicle miles traveled, or how many miles a person travels a day. Uh, once we have that vehicle miles traveled number, that number becomes the input into A or B's emissions factor model, which is MFAC. Um, it's at that point that MFAC puts out a, an emissions number for all of the different pollutants that we've talked about today. And that becomes the conformity analysis that we're talking about at the end of the process. And so what the safe vehicle rule does to MFAC is it potentially invalidates some assumptions within the emissions factors model. And in that invalidation of those assumptions, that requires A or B to potentially update the model, which creates the, the cascading effect on transportation. Well, and I think what's important there, too, is each of our regions is asked to really look at the populations, look at the demographic trends within our region, look at our housing requirements, how we're going to meet those housing requirements, all those things that are going on in our communities. And so I think for all of us to understand that the tremendous amount of work that our partners do to make sure that every dollar we spend is spent effectively uh, it, it's all integrated in terms of uh, it takes time and resources and so I think understanding and maybe if I love your monopoly uh, visual you. but if you could give us a real simplistic one because I think for a lot of people we weren't really connecting the dots and I give you a lot of credit for Thank the you. various career stops you've made in your life that put you to a point where you <laughs> saw all of these things in one image and I Thank think you. that that's important because a lot of us don't. I think we don't, we're not connecting the dots and I, I leaned over to Mary because one of my uh, proud badges of honor is being on the development team for Staples Center and I'm mm -hmm. thinking about you know all of our sports and I'm a huge sports fan and all of our development projects have a transportation component to them. So yep. I think, you know, it's, it's really our endocrine system, as I like to say. Yep. And uh, so, you know, we're kind of talking about what happens with our lungs <laughs> and, and our endocrine so system uh, when we can't, uh, you know, be working together effectively. So thank you very much for thank that you. overview. So with that, uh, thank you everybody. I'm going to ask my first panel. We've cleared the front row here for you all to go because we have another uh, panel coming up and I think it'll help our timing if we ask everybody. Uh, I've got Darren, Andy, uh, Rosa, and Chris coming up to be our next expert witnesses. So if the health doesn't get you, the economics will. <laughs> Both. We need them all. Uh, 
to be healthy. Yes. Okay. Are we good to go, guys? Uh, I think we're going to ask, are you going to speak from down here, or is it better for recording uh, for the webcast when you are speaking, if you'll move up to the podium and uh, take the pulpit, so to speak. So uh, with that, we're going to start with Darren, I believe, that you're up. Oh, you want to go the other end? Okay. Oh, you're a closer. Okay. Well, my <laughs> list had you first, but you know. <laughs> Uh, we'll see. I wasn't in alphabetical order. Yeah. Okay. First batter, batting first, Andy. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Edmund, uh, Chair Nichols, and members of uh, the commission and the board. Uh, my name is Andrew Chesley. I'm the executive director for the San Joaquin Council of Governments, and I will be speaking both on the issue of the waiver in terms of San Joaquin County, but also for the eight uh, MPOs in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, the first uh, point I would like to make uh, regarding this is that the Valley uh, is known for being a breadbasket in terms of producing food uh, for not just the country but the world, uh, but it's also known for some of our inherent poverty when you look at communities like McFarland, Mendota, uh, Delano, uh, the challenges that we face in that. But we also uh, have four of the 110 largest cities in the country. and our. Um, our population, half of our population lives in those four urbanized areas in the San Joaquin Valley. So we face not just the rural challenges, but urban challenges as well. The Valley shares an air basin, the second, uh, uh, the only one of two severe air basins in the country um, due to our weather, due to our topography, and due to the nature of human activity in the San Joaquin Valley. And that has produced all kinds of challenges when it comes to transportation planning. In fact, um, the challenge for us in terms of air quality conformity and the potential loss of the California waiver here in, in the uh, state of California is that it will produce additional challenges for us in terms of meeting um, our air quality conformity activities. We have five pollutants that we must measure on eight different timelines giving us 104 opportunities in the San Joaquin Valley to demonstrate conformity, or in my darker moments, to demonstrate failure to conform. The Valley is dependent upon being able to demonstrate conformity in terms of being eligible for the funding that's come available as a result of SB1, and that uh, brings forward uh, to us the kind of opportunities for prosperity and development that uh, drives much of the uh, the emphasis in our eight MPOs in the San Joaquin Valley. In our last go around uh, dealing with uh, conformity, four of our counties almost didn't make it. Uh, they came very close Stanislaus, Fresno, Kings, and Tulare. The loss of the uh, emissions benefits associated with the waiver um, are produced the potential to drop those four counties into a failure to conform. Individually, we, we conform um, based upon those five pollutants. But should one of us fail to achieve on any one of the 104 measures, then the entire San Joaquin Valley is placed in a position of not being able to amend our regional transportation plans or our regional transportation improvement programs. So even if Kings County, for instance, were to fail on one of those particular measures and go into a lapse, it provides the potential for all of us, because we all share the same air basin, to not be able to amend our regional transportation plans or our transportation improvement programs. What we're looking at here with the loss of the waiver is the potential in the valley over the course of the next 12 to 18 months of $2 billion worth of projects, 97 projects, being put into some form of jeopardy. And then I could give you some examples of some of those. That's Veterans Boulevard Interchange in Fresno, as well as the Bethel Avenue Bikeway Project in a Dr. Sheriff's hometown of Fresno. Uh, it also includes Clarabel uh, Avenue widening on Route 33 in, uh, in Stanislaus County improvements that are dear and dear to Commissioner Van Kenneidenberg's heart. And in my county, um, based upon some of the good work of Secretary Annis, the ability to extend a service to Sacramento and to extend a service to Merced, uh, portions of those 
projects uh, could be put into jeopardy as a result of the failure of us being able to demonstrate conformity as the California Resources Board updates its impact model and as we then adjust our modeling efforts uh, for our regional transportation plan, our transportation improvement program. In our county of San Joaquin, um, and uh, I, uh, I do this at some risk with the comments made by Secretary Inman, uh, uh, Chair Inman, we had, uh, once again, the Stockton Urbanized Area had the longest average commute in the country, followed very closely by Modesto Urbanized Area. 87,000 of our residents in San Joaquin and Stanislaus County get up every morning to travel to work on Interstate 205 and Interstate 580, traveling in front of uh, uh, Commissioner Gilmetti's office on their way to employment opportunities with <laughs> Commissioner Guardino's uh, membership. I need a personal <laughs> this is <laughs> In the city of Tracy, 72% of the households have a commuter who resides in that house. But we're not just trying to make improvements in San Joaquin County for commuters. I mentioned last year when the commission was in Stockton that five years ago, now six years ago, Amazon had no employees in San Joaquin County. Today, they are our largest single employer. The uh, gateway development by Prologis outside of Tracy is the largest uh, industrial uh, distribution development in Northern California. And if you go to Highway 120 and I-5, you can see six uh, warehouse distribution centers in the process of construction at that location. Uh, those are the things that we are trying to deal with in terms of our transportation, either through passenger rail service or through the construction of improved capacity on our roadways. As for instance, we talk about taking Interstate 205 and adding a managed lane to it to match up with 580 in Alameda County. These are the things we're looking at. These are the things that will be put off, delayed, uh, for anywhere from 18 months to three years uh, with the loss of the waiver and its impact on us in San Joaquin County and our transportation planning. Thank you for your attention, um, and I'm happy to speak with any of you at, uh, off the uh, Andy, off before here. you go, uh, I think you're the logical spokesman there also for the ag industry. So if you want to talk a little bit about the fact that we in California are basically feeding the nation. Yes, so we have, uh, the San Joaquin Valley is uh, un unquestionably uh, the largest area in terms of production we have out of our eight counties. Um, seven of them are among the top 10 counties in the country in terms of ag value production. Um, Highway 99 is I think the workhorse of the state highway network based upon in large part the movement of agricultural goods and services uh, to uh, either be the ports of Stockton, Oakland, or down into Southern California. Um, these um, uh, networks of movement, uh, particularly in, in, when we talk about commodity movement of agricultural goods in the San Joaquin Valley are effectively the economic lifeblood of our regions um, uh, whether it be from Kern County to San Joaquin County, uh, whether it be of the wine production in San Joaquin County or uh, the carrots in Kern County. Um, this is what, uh, what we do, what we're known for, and a key component of what we're doing in terms of transportation. Thank you, appreciate it. So I'm gonna guess who's up next, and I think there's a little identity crisis because it says on my agenda that it's Ross, that, I'm pretty right. sure it's Kenna today. It is. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairs Inman and Nichols and members of the Commission and Board. Uh, I'm Kenneth Cow with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Um, I'm not as uh, talented a speaker as uh, Executive Director Chesley, but uh, I'm just going to forward into the slides here. This is a quick map of kind of where we all are in, in location. MTC, of course, is the Bay Area. The nine county Bay Area, we uh, represent over 7 million residents uh, in the Bay Area. Um, so I'm just going to skip forward into my presentation and jump right in to some of the potential project delivery impacts. So Tanisha and Andy did a really great job of explaining the potential impacts of the safe rule and its impact on conformity. And in the Bay Area specifically, a conformity lapse would affect over $20 billion of investments in 40 major projects over the next year. 
Um, those are very large numbers uh, because we have a number of very large projects coming up uh, over the next year. Um, some of the potential uh, impacted projects include the BART extension to Silicon Valley, uh, which leverages billions of dollars worth of local sales tax money as well as regional and state funds uh, to extend uh, heavy rail BART into the San Jose region. Uh, the Caltrain electrification project uh, could also be potentially impacted, which of course would be reducing um, diesel particulate matter as well as uh, increasing kind of the, the level of service on Caltrain. Um, we also have a number of uh, new car replacement, fleet vehicle replacements um, coming on to really improve our state of good repair uh, for the uh, BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit District, as well as the uh, San Francisco Muni light rail vehicles. Um, those could potentially be impacted by the safe rule. And finally, on the highway side, a number of improvements uh, fixing um, some major bottlenecks uh, serving freight routes in our area, including in Alameda County and Solano County, could potentially be impacted. On the greenhouse gas reduction side, um, our uh, regional transportation plan and sustainable community strategies plan barrier 2040 aims to exceed the mandated 2015 greenhouse gas emission target um, by just a little bit. Um, and our key reduction strategy is targeted growth. So. Uh, our plan um, focuses growth, proposes to focus growth on priority development areas. Those are areas within existing communities that have um, good access to transit as well as to ser services and businesses. And in order to do that, we would need supportive infrastructure to promote development in those PDAs. And that could include transit expansion, um, including uh, in the inner uh, ring of the, of the Bay Area, as well as to promote a state of good repair on our streets and on our transit system. And a conformity lapse would definitely complicate the Bay Area's uh, ability to, to meet our, our greenhouse gas emission targets by putting those important projects um, at risk and uh, delayed. And I would be remiss, uh, since uh, Commissioner Inman is here, to not mention that every day is a freight day. Um, the Bay Area is home to the Port of Oakland, which is the fifth largest port, our fifth busiest port in the United States, as well as a designated national um, strategic port. Um, you know, billions of dollars worth of goods go in and out of the port. And it, it some very important near-term investments that could be impacted um, serving the Port of Oakland include a very important uh, railroad grade separation project uh, at the 7th Street at the Port of Oakland, as well as some uh, technology, um, intelligent transportation systems, efficiency improvements to reduce wait times at the port, and also a number of community impact reduction efforts. Um, and so, you know, any, these, these really important efficiency and congestion relief projects could be delayed by the implementation of the SAFE rule, um, and that would impact trade and goods movement not only within the state of California, but nationally. And so again, this is a, a very important topic for us in the Bay, and um, we appreciate um, us coming together and um, kind of presenting this information and hoping to find a way to solve it. Thanks, Kenneth. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, so now um, Darren told me he's bad in cleanup, but this puts him in the third position. So, you know, I guess this is money ball for the panel here. I'm putting my best batters clean up on up the to MPOs, clean up. Absolutely. Uh, uh, well, Chair Nichols and Chairman, thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, thanks to CalCog for really re uh, bringing this issue to a higher level. I think Tanisha did a great job of outlining really what's at stake and where we're at as well uh, is really personalizing because at the end of the day this is about air quality this is about health this is about the ability for all of us uh, and all of our children and all of our relatives to make sure um, that they have clean air to breathe so that they can do the things that they want to do and that we can enjoy it with them um, I wish I could say it's great to be here today but it's not because I mean this is one of those things that is probably government at its worst to some degree is this is uh, the the issue that the public has charged us with um, you know, it sometimes gets conflicted um, and to have to put these types of resources and issues to really addressing the possibility of going backwards at this era when um, there's so much at stake and so much uh, uh, progress and momentum moving forward to address our air quality and congestion issues. Um, it's unfortunate, but I, I think it's important that we're here in, in speaking together uh, to get exactly, as, as Chair Nichols said, to make sure California has a unified voice about what's our path forward so that we can ensure 
um, that the impacts uh, are minimized, if not um, completely uh, avoided altogether. Well, the issue I think has been addressed, I don't think anything I'm going to say has surprised you. Half of the state's population, about, is in the, the Skag region. A reminder, we're not currently in Southern California now, so for those of you that think you're in Southern California, you're not, you know, we represent the six the counties song got that. lost. Um, yeah, I don't know who that guy is. And um, so, but the six counties, you know, over $22 billion in regional transportation plan projects. Um, it's probably greater than that, but that's kind of a conservative estimate at where we're at. Think about what that is in, in terms of uh, economic value to the region, to the state, to the country. These are big numbers, critical numbers um, that really, um, are, are, like I said, could easily uh, be understated. The projects that are at risk are, are various. There are, I'd say, localized projects um, that certainly we could highlight the thousands of them that are there. Um, the 710 uh, project in LA County certainly has national impacts to it because of its impact in the goods movement com uh, 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 community. Certainly, um, there's also you know simple connectors that most people think is a pretty routine project. To, to think something like that could be held up uh, for a national issue is something um, I think uh, we have to really think about and recognize. Um, but more than just talking about the individual projects, I think we could go on all day on that. I think we have to think even, even bigger about this, what it means to Southern California as a region and how these impacts have a lasting impact on the state as well as the country. Um, you know, our transportation uh, plan that we put together, we do a pretty substantial economic analysis on it, about 300,000 jobs created over uh, you know, the this, this several uh, early years of it, um, many of those are at stake. And these are critical jobs for our economy. Obviously, Southern California's economy is doing very, very well right now. But when we look back over the million or so jobs that we lost in the last Great Recession and the gains that we've made since that time, there's a huge gap right in the middle. Low-income uh, jobs have seen substantial growth. High-income jobs have seen substantial growth. The middle class is growing and just barely creeping along. A big part of those jobs are construction jobs on these projects we're exactly talking about right now. Um, so it, it's, it's not just that it impacts everybody, but it has a disproportionate impact on the, the portion of the population that has seen the least amount of gains over our last um, great uh, economic activity. Um, certainly, Southern California, and, and I say Southern California, not just LA, is you know tiered up to host the next uh, Olympic Games because certainly, Commissioner, we think you're from SoCal, right? Of Kehoe. course. Uh, and uh, you know, there's projects that were committed as part of that um, plan that was submitted to the you know, International Olympic Committee, and certainly some of those could be at stake if this doesn't get addressed. So there's international um, certainly considerations here. Um, it's Infrastructure Week, and certainly Chair Enman uh, would want us to focus on the freight uh, impacts of it. And I think we all know it, but it's important to remind that this is uh, an area that is the loading dock for the country. Um, and any impacts in the, the implementation and the delivery of projects around the ports or throughout the Southern California region is going to have rippling economic impacts, not just locally, but throughout the state and throughout the region. So it's not just about the 2,000 plus projects, the $20 billion in projects. It's about big um, economic impacts on top, of course, of the air quality challenges that uh, would be addressed. Um, we touched on, on all of these, I think, already. Um, and I think most everyone else has, has talked about them before. So what do we do? I know you are all action-oriented people. We are all action-oriented people. Um, and I think, you know, again, as Chair Nichols said, we've got to all be on the same page on this. This is um, California going back to D.C. and saying, you know, you need to, uh, you know, let us work within the framework that we've been successful on. Um, I think that message needs to be continued to be articulated to our congressional de delegation. Our group of officers uh, from SCAG are actually back in D.C. right now carrying that message continued outreach to USD and EPA. We've heard just anecdotally that the conformity issue uh, was not really on anyone's radar at all at those levels. So for them to start to process that, even at the later moments of this final rulemaking, we think is certainly very important is going to have a big impact to understand that better. Um, and again, this probably should be number one 
all of us together, we're all on the same team, we're all on the same page. Um, how do we ensure that those messages stay consistent because so many of us are so passionately working on this uh, and know that it's so critical to our future? So uh, with that, I think that concludes the MPO portion and happy to answer any questions. A question, yes, Commissioner Burke. Uh, sorry, question. Part of um, I'd like to touch on this whole idea of outreach to the congressional delegation, share with you a, a recent experience I had. Uh, I probably shouldn't criticize my own agency or my own, but uh, Amtrak decided to uh, change in uh, New Mexico because of the cost of the, uh, some of the safety uh, changes in terms of rail that they would have bus for 100 miles in the center of New Mexico, and I'm sure you're aware of that. Well, after adopting that, the congressional delegation withheld some of the funds, and as a result, that was changed. Now, Amtrak has given up on that bus, which they thought was so great, to have bus for 100 miles. Stop people who are on rail, put them on a bus, take them on a bus 100 miles, then put them on another rail. I mean, I didn't understand it, but I'm just one member. But, you know, I think trying to appeal to what is good and what is in the best interest of air quality and all of those things and business and the economics, I think the most effective way to do this would be to get our congressional delegations to hold back some of the funds. Now, I know that's heresy, but sometimes you have to do, if you really want to change this regulation or this safe rule to eliminate the regulation, certainly there's been a lot of initiative in terms of stopping additional regulations. It seems to me logical you could stop the whole process of rollback of regulation as well as increase regulation, and our congressional delegation would be in a position to do that. If New Mexico can do it, I think California should be able to do it. So I hope that we are spending some time with our lobbyists that we all spend a lot of money on in trying to get to the congressional delegation to take some really strong affirmative positions. Just one person's comment and sharing. We are all That's blessed to have yep. the service of former congressional member Yvonne Burke, <laughs> wise counsel Supervisor True. Burke, and helping us idea. all. Yeah. And past president. No, I. I we That's a great point. Really appreciate Yvonne and, and I was work. just adding she's also a past SCAG president too. Oh, to she her passed. List of, yes, yes. Oh, yes, she was yes, SCAG yes, president, yes. Metro president. Yeah, she's done it all. Uh, she's done it all. Member of the Women's Foundation. Yeah, yeah we love Yvonne. So yeah, uh, it's great. So yeah. with that, okay. Now I think we're ready for the cleanup batter, Chris. So you know, I'm gonna hit it out of the ballpark. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Chris Schmidt from Caltrans, and thank you for having us speak as well, um, um, Chairman Inman and uh, Chairman Nichols. I want to just talk a little bit higher level about some transportation funding in particular, so you have a kind of a sense on the transportation side, just what's at risk overall. You've heard specifically about the dollars and the billions of dollars of projects that the regions are planning to do uh, and deliver. But really, let's, let's talk a little bit more specifically about what the Commission's role is in some of that. So, you know, you're in the midst of developing SB1 guidelines for various funding programs. You've got funding programs for local partnerships, solutions to congested corridor, the trade corridor program, and then ultimately the STIP as well. So all four of those programs, you're going to adopt guidelines with the hopes of programming projects in 2020, and that certainly can go forward. The issue will be that as you program those, and the regions are grateful to receive those projects, their ability to actually access that money and get those projects through this conformity process will be at risk. And so while new money is available, you won't be able to use it because you're really just stuck with the dollars that you currently have programmed in your RTPs and in your TIPs because they won't be able to be amended. 
So new money cannot flow as a result of that. And I think that's really important to understand and, and what that really means in terms of the, the broader landscape as we, we pass the big funding program and we can't actually use those dollars. In terms of what the, the department does with the ITIP is an example of that. You know, we'd be looking to program a new ITIP in, in the, the March of 2020 type time frame. And again, we, we couldn't tap into any of those new dollars if this rule goes into effect and conformity can't be established for those new funds. You know, it's also, as, as we mentioned, it's very important to understand that, that, you know, if the project is regionally significant, it has to be going through this conformity requirement at the regional level. And, and those are all kinds of projects. And as you've heard, there are transit projects, there are roadway projects, there are local projects, there are large projects, smaller scale projects. If they're considered regionally significant and they're not exempt, they're going to be uh, hampered by this. This also includes discretionary federal funds. I know we've, we've talked about not receiving our fair share of those, the infra and build program in particular, but those projects are at risk as well. When we get new dollars and there's, there's you know, current build cycle that you've heard about as we nominate projects for those and compete nationally to receive those dollars hopefully, when those dollars do get awarded to the state and we want to amend those into our programs, we again, we won't be able to amend those into our tips in order to access those dollars and we'll be set behind by that as well. Another strategy that, that may seem like it could work but it, it really doesn't apply is this notion of state only funding. This is not a color of money issue. This is really about whether or not the project when amended is still meeting conformity requirement and if you can't establish that then you can't move forward with the project because that's really important. So um, a little bit on what's exempt and what's not exempt. Uh, a lot of projects are not exempt. What is exempt is roadway maintenance type work. And so, you know, on the lower end of the, of the impact scale is that projects that are maintenance in nature can go forward. Um, and so for, for the department in particular, our shop is essentially exempt. Um, the vast majority, like 99% of the projects in there are exempt. And as a result, those can continue to be advanced. And that's good news in terms of the shop and our ability to meet our um, performance standards that, that you're so familiar with. But there is risk there as well. Uh, as you may be aware, when we do our uh, shop program, our state highway operation protection program, um, we try to bundle those projects with other types of projects, meaning you know, we may be working on maintaining the state highway, but at the same time, a local jurisdiction is making interchange improvements. So we try to bundle the shop work with those other roadway improvement project features to try to deliver a more efficient project that doesn't impact the public overly. Um, and we do that all the time, whether those are HOV lanes, interchanges, or other kinds of operational projects. We try to bundle them to try to make sure that the, the traveling public is only impacted one time. And there's obviously tremendous economies of scale when we do that. So, um, you know, on the higher end, you, you've heard the dire consequences here, so I won't repeat those, but really, you know, not finalizing the rule is certainly the preferred alternative here. And you also heard that this isn't just, and I want to remind ourselves that this, this isn't just an urban issue. There are projects in smaller counties uh, that are also non-attainment that are also going to be affected by that. And you've heard, you know, those communities are often uh, disproportionately affected. So at a higher level and some, some other higher messaging, you know, we need to remind ourselves that this isn't pinning air quality against transportation. We're trying to do all these things simultaneously. You know, we do transportation investments in the state in a very complex regulatory framework already. We try to achieve many different things. We, we obviously trying to address air quality, mobility, and climate change. And we do that through this the collaboration effort, whether that's the, the SIP, whether that's the RTPs, whether that's the California Transportation Plan, you know, whether that's at the air basin level as, as we uh, regulate stationary sources, all of that is a coordinated effort. And when you pull one thing out, you know, it, it kind of falls apart. So we need to remind ourselves just the ripple effect that all of this has. And then I will also just say, and, and you've heard, you know, big, big picture things are at risk. Uh, like, for example, the Olympics, we should understand the national effects of things like that. There does remain a significant amount of uncertainty about this rule itself, so we really don't know, and, and we'll speak to that a little bit later as we look at some of the, the future steps. And I'll, I'll just mention a few other things that haven't been highlighted too much, but I would submit to you, if we didn't have this rule, for example, we would not have Tesla today. There would be no such technologies on the road. 
we would not have developed the types of technologies in terms of battery storage and electric propulsion that you see, and you wouldn't have autonomous vehicles. So I don't think we'd be talking about those because they rely on an electric fleet that operates. Um, and that technology wouldn't have trickled down to other sectors of the transportation industry. I don't think you'd be seeing battery technologies that would support electric bicycles or electric scooters. You know, those things simply wouldn't exist. And now we've developed battery technology that you're going to see in electric buses. And we're even using that same battery storage technology to stabilize our entire electric grid. So when we talk about this, this technology and this innovation going away, where's it going to go? It's going to go to places where they care about this stuff, and they're starting to see that emerging all over the world. You know, you're going to see it in places like China, where they're already making more electric buses than anywhere else. So ultimately, this rule will affect all Californians in many different ways, and I just want to, you know, close with that and just reiterate the fact that, uh, you know, it's the individual people that are ultimately going to hurt when this rule goes into effect. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And, and I think on behalf of our transportation stakeholders, too, we haven't had our airports uh, at the table today, and I think that the connectivity uh, is very, very important for all of us. And I realize we have a, a separate FAA uh, funding package for our airports primarily, but we're still all connected, uh, whether it's the passengers or the air cargo. So I think. Uh, in that regard. And then I, I think our utility partners, I'm not sure if we have our utility partners here, but we did have discussion yesterday. We clearly recognize our integration with our utility partners and discussion about our PG&E partner that's going through some challenging times and what that means uh, for all intended uh, for all of us uh, that need to work together. And then also I think on the water, and I love to tell my water <laughs> buddies that they're nothing but a pond without our transportation modes. So I do think that there are so many different touch points that we're not even really thinking about that we need to be aware of and, and think about the unintended consequences, perhaps. So with that, I'm going to take at least a, a co-chair's prerogative and give us all a little bio break. So if we could take a 10-minute break, that would be great. And please come